But uh, thank you very much for joining us. I, th I think uh, I think everybody here knows Martin. We got a we got a brief, uh, very brief introduction before before you join the call. And um, so I'm going to I'm going to dive straight into a question. Okay. Great. And um, wh one of the questions that was submitted before the before the conference was maybe an easy one. Uh, why did break and continue not get included in the original Scala? And the, the, the questioner has also commented they like it so much. Break and continue. Uh -huh. Okay, so um, I mean there were there were a number of imperative constructs that didn't make it, like the old style, the C style four didn't make it either. So I guess it was felt that uh, since Scala is foremost a functional language, we didn't really want to sort of. Um, um, adopt all these sort of uh, excesses of imperative programming, and uh, I guess break and continue is sort of uh, even more imperative than the other imperatives because it's really sort of like go tos in disguise. So, so we we thought that wouldn't be worthwhile to to add that to the language. That you should express your algorithm rather functionally and not not with break and continue. Later on, we we had a, essentially a way to do it with uh, with exceptions in the library. Okay, thank you. And th there's, there's sort of a, a follow-up question, which is from a different questioner, but they've asked, why are there so many new keywords in Dotty? And uh, why are annotations underused? What, is, uh, what, what helps you decide between making a new keyword and using an annotation? I, I haven't actually counted how many new keywords does Dotty have. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, but I want to say this: that so a lot of them are actually uh, soft keywords. Uh, so we we started to have keywords that essentially only mean something in a specific position. Scala didn't have that before, but now now it will have that. So most of them actually are not something that uh, requires you to rewrite your code because they would still be le legal as an identifier. Um, why not annotations? Uh, I think annotations are overused. Annotations are essentially sort of this sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, a way to f invent new languages on top of old ones. And you can do everything with an annotation, which is uh, precisely the problem. So essentially, you can make languages be very confusing by adding lots and lots and lots of annotations. It's way too easy to invent a new one. So I think a good discipline is to say an annotation should not affect the typing of a program. So it could affect like the interop uh, or, or some other aspects. But for me, the line is where it affects the typing of a program. Uh, I would I would be very, very much against uh, make putting that in an annotation. Um, uh, the I could go further and say annotation shouldn't affect actually the core semantics of a program, but we have already violated that. We, have, for instance, volatile is an annotation, and that definitely affects the semantics of a program, but it doesn't affect the typing of a program. Could could they reasonably uh, affect whether the program compiles or doesn't compile? Yeah, yeah, you could say that. Yeah, yeah. So essentially, your program should still compile if you drop all annotations. Okay, uh, I think it's time we ask the audience a uh, for, for some questions. Does anybody have anything they would like to ask Martin? Uh, question at the front. Uh, if, if, you, if, you sh if you shout it out, I will try to repeat it. Oh, no, there's, there's even a microphone. Okay, uh, so I'm Guy. So just hold the microphone a little bit closer. Hello. Hello, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm that guy that came to Scala from Kotlin, not vice versa. For me personally, Kotlin looks like stolen language, but it's my personal opinion. And every time when we host Kotlin conferences on our company, I hear from Kotlin guys that Kotlin is the future, Scala is dying, key players are ab abandoning Scala, such as Twitter, Wix. Maybe you can say something about new Scala and new future of the Scala, okay. because I'm really relying on you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
if, if you say that, then I would say, well, that, that's just the difference between Scala and Kotlin. Kotlin has is a corporate language, and it seems they have a very aggressive corporate marketing department that essentially they know what FUD means and they know how to spread it. Uh, and I don't really appreciate that, where Scala is really basically an open source language. We don't really have evangelists on staff, staff that essentially promote promote theories like that. Um, we have some data we, we, we have seen uh, essentially from all the downloads, compiler users and things like that. The most accurate uh, data we have is that Scala use is currently growing at about 20% per year. Uh, so it's definitely not dying. Uh, if you look at uh, all other indicators, then I think it's, it still shows that it's very, very strong. I believe it will get a big boost when we go to Scala 3, because that will be a language that is in all ways superior to uh, old Scala and also Kotlin as well. OK. Um, there was a there was a question that someone asked about uh, about Kotlin. Maybe it was maybe it was similar to yours. Um, how, how, can I just ask the audience, how many people here have tried Kotlin? How many people like Kotlin more than Scala? <laughs> so no, nobody, nobody has put their hand up. So that, that sounds like a, an entirely fair and balanced uh, outcome. Of a selection bias. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's nothing Kotlin wouldn't do. No, no. But I mean, listen, uh, Kotlin, again, I, I think some well, there's a saying that says imitation is the best form of flattery. So I'm not at all. So if, if Kotlin becomes a really strong language, I would really welcome that. Uh, because, I mean, Kotlin, as we all know, has taken a lot of the ideas of Scala, basically most of them, uh, with the exception of uh, I can only see two big ones, higher kind of types and implicits. And I believe there are essentially um, efforts underway to add one or the, the other as well to Kotlin. So that would sort of make it complete. Uh, I think Kotlin is overall um, has more accidental features than Scala. Scala is a more orthogonal language, a smaller language than Kotlin is. And it, at the same time, a more powerful language because it has implicits and, and higher kinds. But anyway, I mean, if Kotlin drags Java programmers Three quarter of the way to Scala, then that's a good thing. So I, I am not, I don't, I don't see that at all as a competition. So may, maybe we could have some Java developers first moving to Kotlin and then moving on to Scala. Exactly. Why not? Um, there was a question over there. I'm going to come to you in a moment um, because somebody else has asked uh, a question uh, uh, beforehand uh, about type level programming capabilities in Dotty, which is probably an area that Kotlin is weaker in. I would say significantly weaker. And uh, the question is, um, currently match types are limited. For example, they don't support recursive definitions. And rewrite functions are also in development. Can you explain your vision about these features and type level programming in Dotty in general? Match types definitely uh, support recursive definitions. So uh, uh, that must have been a, a fairly old snapshot uh, that that uh, that the uh, a person that, who asked uh, got got away. No, they, they they can definitely support recursive definitions. So I think match types are essentially the type level backbone as far as types go. And uh, could, you, could you just explain very briefly to the people who don't know how match types would be used? OK, so a match type is uh, essentially you, you have a match uh, on a type. Uh, and a match on a type is a kind of type. So you can say, say some type match. And then you have cases, and each case is another type. And each uh, a case gets taken if the scrutiny type is a subtype of the pattern type. So that way you can essentially select one of a set of alternatives depending on your scrutiny type. And they definitely can be recursive, which means you can uh, use them to do uh, interesting things that have been done with implicit so far. So the poster child of that is age lists. Uh, so um, age lists that have been done with implicits and shapeless and other libraries now are actually the standard tuple type in Scala 3. So if you write a tuple, one, two, three, then yes, it's an age list. And the thing that makes it work is all with match types. So all the operations on them, like you can concatenate two, two tuples with precise types, you can select an element and so on. All these operations are essentially expressed in terms of these match types. And since tuples can be arbitrary long, yes, of course, you need recursion for that. And they'll be fast. 
and they'll be hopefully fast. Yes, uh, so far we haven't seen a, a performance bottleneck, but we, we will see once programs really scale up. Great. Um, there was a question over there. Um, do you have the mic? Great. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Martin, for uh, the best language I ever used in my life. <laughs> and for still contributing in and uh, working on it. So uh, my question is uh, about uh, Doty. Uh, maybe uh, uh, where can we as expect this uh, release? And uh, I saw only uh, one feature considered, but not in progress or completed, that uh, effects in Doty. Uh, so yeah. uh, do you consider uh, integrating with uh, Casfax or Zio or something contributing by itself and uh, so kind of uh, what, yeah. what how how affects uh, would would okay. matter in that thanks thanks for the question um so it's it's a matter of timing so we are fairly close to feature free for for scala 3 uh, and uh, for that release we have essentially restricted ourselves to say we want to put everything in there that is a clear simplification or a restriction, uh, an essential restriction where we say, well, things have been abused before, we want to put in a restriction to essentially avoid abuses in the future. Uh, and the, 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 the motivation for that is to say, well, Scala 3 is a big uh, uh, jump from Scala 2. There will be quite a few things that changed. So in the end, all the books, tutorials, and things like that, uh, if they're not super basic, they will have to be rewritten uh, because there are now, in many cases, better ways to do things than in previously. For instance, uh, uh, many, many simple class hierarchies can be expressed with enums, and enums haven't existed in Scala. So even beginners' books will want to be rewritten because we want to tell people about these enums, which are often um, a much simpler way to, to express the same things with classes, just to mention one example. So that means that essentially everything that goes into an intro, uh, all the essentially simplifications and essential restrictions should be in Scala 3, because Scala 3 is sort of the moment when the books will be rewritten. Everything that essentially is more advanced, either experimental or gives you more power, could go in later versions. And we have already a lot of things to do for Scala 3.0. So basically now the default is it will go in later versions. And effects are definitely on that, uh, on that, uh, in, the, in that uh, set to say, well, we, 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 have, we are very interested in effects and we think we have a way uh, that's promising that we want to explore, but it won't come in Scala 3. It will come in Scala, I don't know, 3.5 or 4 or whatever. And I think the question also asked, when, when can we expect Dottie to be released? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so uh, we have a, uh, so the time plan is to go into feature freeze uh, this year, uh, hopefully summer this year. They're still on the level of meta programming and type level programming. There's something still in flux, which we have to work out. And we, if they take longer, they take longer. But the rest of the language is fairly much uh, fixed by now. And then we we want to give ourselves basically about one year for uh, stabilization. So that means essentially working on the implementation, working on error messages, working on porting libraries, working on uh, specification documentation, and so on. So for that we have. So that means the release will be in 2020. Uh, about when is not quite clear yet. So the optimistically thing would be again summer 2020, but uh, it might slip slip a little bit. We will we'll see. OK, thank you. A uh, question in the middle here. We're just going to wait for the microphone to arrive. Mm -hmm. But uh, just, just one more uh, uh, remark to that. Uh, so feature freeze means that we will have essentially fairly stable developer previews from this summer on. So if you want to sort of already get prepared for it and try it out and maybe uh, port your library or uh, try it out in an applications, then from basically this summer on, you will know that we, will, we won't change the language under your feet. It's just that uh, the ecosystem needs some time to migrate. So if you, let's say, depend on a lot of other libraries, then give it a year. And hopefully, they will be there in a year. OK, go ahead with the question. Hi, Martin. Um, is it possible to add a type inference for local or inner functions so you do not have to write types for arguments of a function and return types, at least for inner and local functions? Uh, is it possible to make it into Doty? 
or at least have uh, some sort of type holes in that. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, there was a discussion um, whether that's a good thing or not. Um, it would be fairly simple to do. Um, the the SIP committee wasn't convinced that it's a good thing. And um, we decided then in the end, well, it's one of the things that could be deferred because I guess if you talk to a beginner, then uh, for at least for new people and maybe for everyone, it's actually better discipline to write out the parameter types. Yes, it's a, bit, a little bit of more writing, but it's also clearer. So are there situations where it's actually better to drop them? Maybe, maybe not. We need more time to, to, to come to a decision. It would be very easy to do, but it's not quite clear yet. Uh, whether it's worthwhile doing, and uh, the members of the SIP committee are not don't quite agree on that. I'm more on the side why not, but uh, like I said, we, we have to we have to all agree to for for a feature to be to be accepted. So it's not it's certainly not completely ruled out. Okay. It's not completely ruled out, yeah. But again, it won't it, it won't come in three zero. Okay, so one one follow up, well, small one. Could you please hide it behind the flag or something? <laughs> <laughs> if, if the, the, wants... SIP, the SIP committee will will decide <laughs> yeah, details. Yeah. Like just that, a suggestion. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and a, a question in yellow. Uh, hi, Martin. Um, going back to our <laughs> comparison to, to Kotlin, uh, what's your opinion about uh, coroutines and uh, whether there are plans to have something like this in uh, Scala? Thank you. Yeah, coroutines are really nice uh, and. Uh, uh, I, I really think we should we should do that. Uh, it's uh, it's definitely something where I would encourage people to just get together and 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 do something. There is actually a, a very nice way to do coroutines in Scala, but I, I'm not sure how up to date it is. It's called Scala coroutines by Alex uh, Prokopek. Uh, he he did a really nice implementation of these coroutines, uh, and uh, maybe we should just uh, adopt them. But uh, since what, since me personally, I'm I'm currently really focused on the language proper and uh, uh, coroutines uh, as they are implemented in Scala. Coroutines seem to be sort of a more uh, a mixture between runtime and library, say. So they need some runtime support and otherwise library support. But I'm I'm definitely in favor of doing something like that because. Uh, I think that um, essentially having having a nice way to express asynchronous computations uh, is is very important, and it avoids a lot of the messes with uh, with having to push that all in in futures or something like that. Okay, um, there's, a, there's a slightly mysterious question that was sent in before, um, asking Martin: Does the phrase "stable equilibrium" have any significant meaning to you? And if so, what is it? Stable, stable equilibrium. Stable equilibrium. That could be a number of things. Yes, I think you. I think you have to read between the lines. <laughs> is 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 the person who asked this question in the audience? Uh, Marco, would you like to elaborate? Okay. Um, can we get the mi microphone over here? Um, hi, Martin. Thanks for your work. Uh, I want to ask you a question. Will ever uh, be de uh, true dependent types in Scala? Oh, so um, we, I, I, had, I had intended for uh, Marco to elaborate on his stable equilibrium question. Um, ah. can, we, can we do that first and then we'll go back to your question? Okay. Sorry. I've heard you used the words stable uh, equilibrium. Mar Marco, cl closer to your mouth. I've heard you used the words stable equilibrium in more than one occasion, and sometimes also it feeds back from the audience when they are able to ask you questions. In that sense, I was interested whether the phrase stable equilibrium means anything to you at all. <laughs> well, <laughs> actually quite surprised that I could have said that, so I'm not sure in what context I said it. Like I said, it could mean a number of things, but I, nothing particular comes to mind now. Okay, um, I, I, said, I said it was a mysterious question. Can we, can we go to the person who asked the, the question I wasn't expecting, please? <laughs> Just three, three rows back. Thank you. Sorry, sorry to make you ask the question again. Um, I'm asking about uh, dependent types in Scala. Will uh -huh. ever they be in Dirty or uh, maybe next releases? 
Or so not you mean then, yeah. full, full dependent type, not path dependent type, what we have now. So, um, so uh, that is uh, three goes a little bit further than um, than current Scala in the in the sense that we have dependent function types. Um, so that uh, means we can live essentially method, method, methods that depend on a parameter type, we can lift them to function types. So that brings you a bit further to essentially full dependent types. Now, of course, full dependent types, it's not a single destination. It's sort of a very broad field. There are many, many ways to, to, uh, to have uh, dependent, essentially richer dependent types. Uh, and uh, it's definitely sort of on, on the roadmap to investigate these things. Uh, I should say a lot of that, I think, at the current time is still research. So that means uh, there's no really concrete time plan and no promises are made, but it's definitely something that people are looking into. Also, people in my group are looking into how one could get essentially more uh, richer dependent type systems in, in the language. Uh, I should say both dependent types and refinement types are really interesting. So refinement types are essentially types that you can add, you can, ha you can attach predicates to types, conditions to types, sort of like contracts, but um, uh, resolved at compile time and not at runtime. So both of these are quite interesting and that both of these are actually interconnected. Okay, but, thanks. Uh, Sorry. Thank, thanks, Martin. Um, can someone tell me uh, how much longer we have? Just so I can time this. Ruslan, do you, do you know? Ten, ten minutes? About, about ten minutes. Okay, um, go ahead with the next question, please. Uh, hello, Martin. I'm Yuri. Uh, and uh, my question about the uh, future of SBT of, uh, con in context of Doti. I'm using Gradle for a build Scala uh, applications because it's faster and uh, simple uh, in many cases. What about SBT future? Well, I'm, I'm, it's difficult. It's not really for me to, to say the number of build tools. Uh, SBT is one of them. It's sort of the, the most uh, uh, widely used one, I think. Uh, I, I believe that um, we should we should keep an open mind and uh, maybe not not push a specific build tool. So if Gradle is faster, that's great, and we should. In fact, there are efforts by the Scala Center to support Gradle better, so to essentially do incremental compilation for Gradle and and these sort of things, uh, and also Maven. So I think we should we should be very open minded. And for instance, a lot of enterprises use Bazel, which is also a very good build tool. Mill is a very nice alternative to SPT. Uh, I would for, say for the moment, let's, let's just see what develops. And uh, uh, then maybe something out of completely out of left field, like Fury will come and, and, and take the world. Uh, uh, and then everybody will build from source. Who knows? I, I would just say keep an open mind. Uh, th thanks, Martin. I appreciate it. Uh, th th there, are, there, is a, there is a talk later on Basil, I think. Uh, and I'm giving a talk on Fury. So there are... <laughs> There are talks on build tools at this at this conference, so you can come along to those. Uh, yeah, question. <clears throat> Hi, Martin. Uh, my name is Vladimir. Uh, at the beginning, you said that overuse of annotation is a bad practice. That's why you have a lot of keywords in uh, new Scala. Uh, what about metaprogramming? Overuse of metaprogramming is also a bad practice, or not? Uh, yeah, I think uh, mostly. Most cases, in most cases, I would say yes. Uh, it's obviously the, the question is uh, use the simplest tool that does the job. And I have the impression meta programming is often used when there would be simpler tools. So I would be, I, I, I would say, well, maybe sometimes you have to resort to it. But uh, I, I have the impression that um, sort of meta programming is, is a bit in the same camp as implicit conversions that you say seems to be handy, but most of the usages are actually abuses, and you should, you should have done something else. Uh, so that's sort of my completely unqualified opinion. I can't back it up, it's just a gut feeling. Uh, so um, yes, I would say we should strive to uh, have less magic in metaprogramming and essentially more consistency in the language, uh, because otherwise we, we risk falling prone to what people sometimes call, call the Lisp curse, 
that essentially everybody does their own language in the dialect because essentially there are all these great toolboxes and it's so malleable and no, then nobody can talk to each other. So, so that's that's that. Uh, thank you for equilibrium in your opinion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I, um, let me let me ask another question from someone who submitted beforehand. Um, this this one's maybe a little bit different. Uh, someone asks, um, do you listen to music when you code? And if so, what do you listen to, if, if you don't mind sharing? Uh, I don't listen to music when I code. I would, I would break my concentration. I'm not <laughs> OK. Uh, and and um, this, this one's looking a little bit further into the future. Uh, what will be your next step after Dotty? Oh, um, I, I'll, I'll be I'll be busy a long time with this because uh, essentially now that we essentially well now we're going to feature free so we know what it is then we have a, a year or so to actually deliver on it uh, uh, and during that year and later on we I have to redo all my MOOCs uh, because uh, well the language has changed and uh, rewrite the book or write another book and uh, essentially do a lot more in terms of um, uh, teaching people about that. So that will take me, keep me busy for a while. And then, of course, we want to look at also the, the other exciting things that might be down the road. Uh, and the, the one that sort of is, is lined up really next to look into seriously is effects. But like I said, that will be after three. And, and will we get a, a Scala 3 language spec? Well, that would also be the hope for uh, for this stabilization year. That at the end of that year we should have a spec. Uh, okay. Uh, any 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 more questions from the audience? There's one at the back. Yeah. Uh, hi. I guess that uh, all Scala lovers are using Monad heavily, and uh, my question is: Are there any plans to improve for comprehension, or at least to make it closer to, for example, Haskell's do notation? Do you, do you have any um, any any particular suggestions for how for comprehensions might be improved? No, for example, make uh, underscores optional in case of if we are not interested in the monot result. Yeah, yeah. The, the, I mean, SIP, the SIP process is open. Everybody can make a make a proposal, and I mean, people have to work on a, on a spec and an implementation of these things. So uh, definitely, we we definitely are very open to that but again essentially the time plan is is quite rigid here so i think extended for comprehensions is definitely something that will not uh simplify the language so it's not so so the 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 asset test is really um does this new feature now give me something that would make it easier to explain to a novice what Scala is, or is it additional functionality? If it's additional functionality, it will come in 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, uh, but not in 3.0. And for comprehensions is definitely one of these things. So we're not under time pressure to add them now. All right, thanks, thanks, Martin. Um, we probably have just a couple of minutes left. I think I'll, I'll go for one more, um, one more question that maybe has a deep technical answer. Um, Martin, uh, what, uh, what do you think about uh, type class coherency? Should all type classes be coherent uh, or um, should we have the possibility of having incoherent type classes? Yeah, I'm, but we, we, have, we had thought about these things a lot and in the end the answer I believe is firmly no, we do not want type class coherency. Uh, we have now in the new uh, language a very nice scheme to do local disambiguation, uh, which means that you're no longer stuck in these sort of diamonds where you have a monad and an apl applicative and now the map is ambiguous and there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, so there is something you can do about it now because essentially you can just essentially write a nested definition which acts, acts as a tiebreaker. Uh, I believe coherence is clearly anti-modular. It, it talks about essentially a single instance for the whole program. So as soon as you put the word the whole program in your mouth, you are anti-modular. It's not, it's not a modular way to treat things. In a modular way to treat things, there is no program. There are there's just components that can be integrated in larger components. So that's sort of the meta thing. And 
the the other thing is it's very practical that I, I believe that well yes Haskell has a culture say we can avoid that with essentially the uh, lots of new types so basically whenever we want to change functionality for a type we we can't do that so we invent a new type and then you have deriving vr and very complicated things to sort of get uh, as much as possible operations on this type without having too much boilerplate and it's certainly a local optimum that way uh, but i believe it's fundamentally for at least for scala it's the wrong thing because again i, I believe it's anti-modular you should be able to disassociate the type uh, with the operations on that type and the fact that haskell doesn't do it is well because haskell doesn't have a module system so they're sort of they they're forced to they were sort of forced to it was very natural for them to go into that direction but we don't have to copy all right, that's very clear. Any any questions remaining from the audience? The microphone is roaming. Um, one at the front here. Uh, I think this will be the last one. <coughs> I think we probably need to wrap up after this. Go go ahead. Uh, hello, Martin. Uh, it is common that uh, when people work on a project a lot of time, so usually people get in more calm or something like this. So I'm wondering where do you get, uh, where do you take the energy from? That's a great question to finish on. I'm, I'm actually having lots of fun doing what I do. Uh, it's great. Uh, and so uh, I'm, I'm almost regretting it's, it's sort of basically for a moment that, uh, that we'll have to stop with uh, thinking about features and how they act together and things like that uh, and, and writing the compilers for it. So I'm, I'm having a ball and that gives me energy. All right, I think that's a, that's a perfect uh, response. Uh, Vic Victor, you have. Hello, Martin. Do you have any plans to visit Kyiv next year? <laughs> Scala year. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Thank, thank you very much, Martin. Thank you for joining yeah. us. Um, thank you, everyone. My, 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 my apologies to you for rushing you to, to get to the computer. No, no, sorry, I, I, I could have been here earlier. I just didn't. <laughs> And, uh, we, we got it. The uh, wires crossed. No problem. Well, and, and, and also, also my uh, my my apologies to the audience for keeping you waiting as well. It is it is my yeah. fault. So, thank you very much. And would you all thank Martin again one last time? Thank you. Thank you.